Oh, okay, okay. So it seems that everyone can hear me. So good morning, everyone. And uh, I'm very pleased to be here. Although invitation was very unexpected for me, <laughs> this lecture had to be given by our Ministry of Environment representatives. But situation has turned out <laughs> in such a way that we could not come. So we asked me to, 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 to speak a little bit about river basin management in Lithuania. Uh, so I'm an expert working in the Center of, uh, for Environmental Policy. So it's non-governmental institution, non-governmental organization. And we, me and my colleagues, and as well as other experts, we've been involved in preparation of river basin management plans in Lithuania since the first cycle. So we are already in the third cycle and we again have a project to support our competent authorities in preparation of river basin management plans. So as I've been involved in this issue for already many years, so I hope that I will be able to present this topic sufficiently well. And yeah. So maybe not of you, all of you are familiar with uh, what the framework directive. So I, I would like to start my presentation just from a very brief introduction to what the framework directive. So what are the main requirements of the directive? So the directive says that all water resources have to be managed by individual river basin districts. And the main objective of a, a directive is achieving good ecological and chemical status of all water bodies in, in the country. So all countries have to identify competent authorities for the application of the rules of a directive. So we have competent authority also in Lithuania, which is Environmental Protection Agency and the Ministry of Environment. And then I split these requirements in two columns. So one is um, river basin management plans. Directive requires all member states prepare river basin manage, management plans. So this is the main, how to say, document for management of water resources. And here I just listed main bullet points, main uh, issues that have to be included in the river basin management plans. So all countries, they have to characterize their river basin districts and designate heavily modified and all other water bodies. They have to conduct pressures and impacts analysis uh, compile register of protected areas, uh, they have to design monitoring programs, uh, establish environmental objectives of all for all water bodies, uh, perform economic analysis for water uses, and uh, prepare programs of measures, the summary of which has to be included in river basin management plans. Uh, so when you look at those bullet points, it looks quite simple. You just have to do, do some things and put it into management plans. But all, all of who was working with preparation of river basin management plans must know that it's really complicated document and really challenging thing, preparation of those river basin management plans. And uh, many, how to say, challenges and uh, difficulties arise, uh, starting from development of uh, classification methodologies, uh, because the directive, how to say, it sets maybe some provisions and general framework how, to, how it has to be done. But countries are left a lot of uh, how to say freedom to develop their own uh, methodologies. And this is really, really big task for, for each country as I know. So when river basin management plans are produced, and problems identified. So all countries in parallel, we have to prepare programs of measures uh, where measures to achieve good status have to be considered. So as regards measures, this is, there are two, two, two types of measures. These are called so basic measures, which are standing, so-called standing policies. So these are measures which are required by other water sector directives such as nitrate directive, urban wastewater treatment directive, IPPC directive, uh, habitats, birds and habitats, all directives that may have, I would say, any relation to water issues. And it, if it is evaluated that these basic measures are not sufficient to achieve good status in all water bodies, then countries have to identify supplementary measures. They can be different from restoration, rehabilitation of uh, rivers, let's say, abstraction controls, uh, additional measures for reduction of agricultural pollution, 
and, and so on. So that's the general structure of, uh, of directive. And maybe it's important to measure that implementation deadlines for all measures can be extended uh, by two uh, measurement cycles of, uh, of the directive. I will talk later about the cycle uh, of the process and later by 2027. So we are very close to the deadline now. Okay, and then again, it's simplified, simplified, uh, how to say, picture to show what is the way uh, towards uh, achieving for the framework directive. So, as I've mentioned, all countries, first of all, we have to establish legal and institutional framework. We have to prepare documentation for, for management, river basin management plans and program of measures. These documents have to be constantly updated for each six year management cycle. Uh, countries have to implement measures and finally achieve good status of all water resources. And uh, yeah, Bayunas was talking today about effectiveness of measures. So. Uh, it's, how to say, the easiest thing to establish measures and estimate um, their effectiveness, but it's a big challenge to implement in reality those measures. And I will talk maybe later about this challenge related to implementation of measures in the QA. Okay, okay, and now a few words about the uh, direct implementation timeline. So directive came into force in 2000, and all member states uh, were obliged to prepare their first river basin management plans in 2010. And then the first management cycle has started, and it ended in 2015, where first plans were revised. And now we are at the beginning of the third river basin management cycle, or at the end of the second one. So now we are here. And you see that we have, how to say, final stage, final, uh, final chance to, to implement our measures and achieve good status of all water resources. So uh, no one knows what is happening after 2027, but the directive, which was uh, adopted in 2000, uh, in 2000, it considered, how to say, the end of the whole process in 2027. So very optimistic to think that everything will end in 2027. Okay, so now we come to Lithuania and the short introduction how we manage our water resources. So we have four river basin districts delineated in Lithuania. Uh, the largest one is green in my computer. And I, I don't know how it looks on your screen. Uh, this is the Namunas River Basin District. Uh, then the purple one, the Antai River Basin District, Lielupi River Basin District, and finally the small one, Dogova River Basin District. So all our river basin districts are transboundaries. So that means that we share our resources, water resources with neighbors. So we are dependent from Belarus and Russia in the Namunas CBD, where we have inflows from neighboring countries. And, and we transport, transport our pollution to Latvia, Inventa, and Yellow River Basin District. So Dogova is very neutral. It's, we share it, but we do not transport <laughs> uh, big, big problems there. Uh, what is the progress with uh, management plans and programs of measures? So as I've mentioned, all countries were obliged to prepare their programs of measures and plans. Uh, first, first ones in 2010, so we succeeded well, we, we did this, and these the documents were prepared and that adopted. Uh, later, uh, all those uh, first uh, cycle documents were updated for the second cycle, which is uh, ending now, and now we are at the beginning of the, I'd say, ending the second cycle and starting the third one. And now we are working on preparation, our, our competent authorities, we are working on preparation of the third plans and programs of measure. So what is different from previous cycles, that in previous cycles, uh, experts, external experts were involved to great extent, let's say, and programs of measures and plans were fully prepared, I think, by, by experts. In the first cycle, we had a very international team. We have experts from Denmark, and Latvia, and France working on these documents. Uh, in the second cycle, only Lithuanian experts were working on the documents. And now our competent authorities, they are already preparing documents themselves, only hiring us as experts for just preparing some segments of, of, of the documentation. And it's 
hopefully, uh, poet river basin management plans and programs of measure, measures should be prepared by the end of this year. Yeah, so we are very busy now to help our institutions to provide all the necessary information for this document. Uh, then again, to management units. So smallest water, uh, smallest management units are water bodies. So what are criteria for delineation of water bodies in Lithuania? So we have river water bodies, and we delineate river stretches uh, which are which have catchment area larger than thirty square kilometers for for water bodies. Directive requires um, to delineate smaller rivers with catchment areas of 10 square kilometers, but because of hydrologic conditions in Lithuania, we observe that very small streams with very small catchment areas up to 30 square kilometers, they dry out in, in completely in summer months, and any measurement of biological parameters has no sense in them. So we argued that we cannot follow the strictly requirements of the directive. And I think European Commission has accepted that. So our water bodies are those stretches which, are, which have catchment areas larger than 30 square kilometers. And again, length of rivers. Uh, we decided not to include very, very small stretches. So we only consider those which are longer than three kilometers. For example, sometimes there is a situation when we have very short, uh, short stretches of river between lakes, so we do not consider them as individual water bodies. We just remove them if the length is less than three kilometers. And as set uh, by directive, water body is a river stretch of the same time and the same ecological state. So we estimate ecological status of water bodies, and then we have to say um, designate them to individual water bodies. So the total number of water bodies for today of rivers is 822. Uh, since, the, since the first cycle, this number has decreased a little bit because we joined some water bodies and we made some revisions and so on. But we realized that management of water bodies then is very difficult when number and encoding changing. So we are revising the uh, number of water bodies now for the third cycle, but we're trying not to do big changes so that the number of water bodies remain nearly the same as it was in, in the second cycle. For lake water bodies, these are lakes and ponds with surface area of uh, more than 50 hectares. So this is completely in line I think, with, with what the director says. So today we have 300 and 57 lake and ponds, uh, water bodies, but we realized that some few near the border, near border with Latvia are missing. So we will add three lakes, I think. So it will be round number 360 for, for, this, for the nearest side. And additionally to lakes and rivers, we have transitional and coastal water bodies, so four transitional and two coastal water bodies. Uh, transitional coastal water bodies, uh, transitional water bodies in the Chromian Lagoon and coastal water bodies in the along the seaside. Okay, so how, we, as I mentioned, the main objective of the directive is uh, achieving the ecological status of water resources. So how we estimate ecological status of water resources. So we use, as it is, how to say, defined by a directive, we use biological parameters to classify status, physical chemical parameters, and hydromorphological parameters. So of biological parameters, this is what, uh, in line, what is in line with uh, directed pooling. For rivers, uh, we measure phytoplankton. Uh, phytoplankton is used for assessment only ecological status of two main largest rivers, because it's not used in small ones. Uh, it's only for the recent gamma's. Uh, we, we also, also used microfly uh, measure macrophytes, phytobenthos, benthic, invertebrate fauna, and fish fauna for rivers. For lakes, phytoplankton, macrophytes. Uh, I put phytobenthos in italic because uh, in the first two cycles we did not have uh, reference conditions for phytobenthos, but I think now this. Uh, 
criteria and this uh, indicator has been developed by our scientists. So I think we will use already fire, fire photo plankton's for, uh, for classification of status of lakes. Uh, and ventric invertebrate fauna is in place and fish fauna is in place. So all, all now we have full set of parameters required by the director. For transitional and coastal water bodies, here again we had some deviation from a directive because few parameters were missing by, by this period. So microalgae and angiosperms in transitional water bodies were missing. So our uh, um, scientists from Klaipeda University, they are working very hard now to develop uh, these, um, uh, these parameters because we had um, comments from EU, com EU Commission uh, saying that these parameters have to be developed in Lithuania, as well as benthic invertebrate fauna for all transitional and coastal water bodies. And other parameters, uh, they are in place, they, they were in place in previous cycles as well, is that phytoplankton and fish fauna. Fish fauna is used for classification of status only for transitional water bodies. Okay, so these are biological parameters. So hydromorphological quality elements. So we use hydromorphological index, and it covers assessment of hydrological regime of water bodies, that is quantity and dynamics of water flow, river continuity and morphological conditions, channel type and its characteristics, structure of riparian zone and structure and substrate of the riverbed. So if you look at the annex of the directive, so it is exactly what directive requires. So everything is in place regarding hydromorphological quality elements. Uh, for lakes as well, we are in line with what the framework directed, assessing uh, hydrological regime at water level and residence time and morphological conditions, structure of lake shore, structure and substrate of the lake bed. I don't remember, if, uh, I didn't say anything on my slide uh, uh, about transitional and coastal water bodies. Uh, hydromorphological uh, parameters were missing for transitional and coastal water bodies until now. And now, uh, as well, uh, um, scientists in Klaipeda University are trying to develop these missing, missing methods for hydromorphology. But the problem is that all water bodies they are, hi are highly affected by human activities. So it's not easy to establish reference conditions for hydromorphology in transitional and coastal water bodies. So these are the problems we are trying to fix now. Um, Although we are, even our scientists are not sure if we will succeed because those things are very complicated and a lot of data is needed to establish reliable relations with, with biology and, and, and so on. So we will see what, what happens. Uh, regarding physical chemical parameters, uh, in rivers we monitor BOD, dissolved oxygen, ammonia, nitrogen. We, sorry, we are monitoring more, but we use these parameters for classification of ecological status. So total nitrogen, phosphate, phosphorus, and total phosphorus. So these parameters were selected based on the correlation uh, with biology. So those parameters were estimated as correlating closely with biological parameters. So for this reason, they are used uh, for classification of ecological status of surface water bodies. Uh, for lakes, uh, transparency BOD7, total nitrogen, and total phosphorus are used. And for transitional and coastal water bodies, only total nitrogen and total phosphorus. So these are parameters which define and describe our ecological status of, of surface water bodies. And here we can see river monitoring network where measurements are done. And this, this is network for the second management cycle. We still do not have any revision for the third one. And um, uh, this uh, network looks quite dense maybe, but you have to have in mind that monitoring is not how to say, constantly formed in those water, in, in those stations. We have rotational monitoring as this is allowed for by the water framework directive. So that means that annually, not in all those dots, the monitoring is carried out. And now I can tell a few words about how monitoring program is designed in the So, we have three types of monitoring stations. We have surveillance, uh, two types of surveil surveillance monitoring, surveillance intensive and surveillance extensive monitoring sites. So for surveillance intensive, we, have, we are planning more measurements 
and we uh, consider those patients only in transboundary water bodies where we need a better assessment of status trends and loads and on main tributaries, which are needed for Soyunas to do modeling better, <laughs> to kind of break model. Uh, and uh, we also have uh, surveillance intensive monitoring sites in nitrates directive points, which are, this is monitoring required by nitrates directive. So there are a few places in agricultural catchments where we do surveillance intensive monitoring. Uh, surveillance extensive monitoring is less extensive as you perhaps already understand. And we consider the stations in water bodies which are not affected by significant pressures, and we assume that they are or they should be in good status. So these, state, these monitoring sites, they are used to observe trends and uh, to, identify if, if, to identify if problems occur, or if not just to classify status of, of good, good water bodies. And finally, we have operational monitoring sites. So these are monitoring sites which are located in water bodies at risk. That means in water bodies which have already problems or expected or suggested to have, potentially have any problems of, of state. So these are three, three types of, of monitoring stages. So uh, as I've already mentioned, monitoring frequency is different in, in these stages. So in surveillance intensive for physical chemical parameters, uh, in this table, you can see first number representing the number of measurements in a year. And after slash, uh, this number after slash uh, represents number of measurements in a six year cycle. So that means that physical chemical parameters in surveillance intensive stations is performed 12 times per year and six years in a six year management cycle. That means that every year, 12 times per year. Uh, and surveillance extensive monitoring stations, we do measurements only twice in a six year management cycle. That means that we have one, one monitoring, how to say, uh, not, not even, <laughs> one monitoring effort in a three year period. And uh, frequency also is lower, it's the four measurements per year. So one measurement in, in spring, one in summer, one in autumn, and one, one in winter. Uh, in, in lakes, uh, frequency is a little bit different. Uh, and this is deviation from a water framework directive because the directive requires 12 measurements per year in surveillance intensive monitoring stations. But we considered that it's not reasonable to do 12 measurements uh, in, in lakes. We do only seven. And I think uh, European Commission agrees on that and they accept our justification. And it's because of hydrology. It's not obviously reasonable to do measurements in, in winter and lakes. So instead of 12, we use seven measurements per year in, in lake. Uh, as regards uh, um, biological quality elements, uh, you can see in this table frequency is much lower. Uh, many, most of biological quality elements are monitored once a year and twice in a six year management cycle. And this is in line with what the framework directive. So this is what is sufficient to classify to classify status of, of surface waters. Okay, so now we can look what is the status of Lithuanian water bodies. Uh, here you can see map from the second management cycle uh, with classification of ecological status. And uh, yellow does not look uh, good on screens, I know, but it is requirement of a water framework directive to, to depict it in, a, in, in yellow. So you can see blue ones and green ones, water bodies which are in very good and good ecological status, and uh, yellow, which is in moderate ecological status, and orange in, the, in bad, and uh, uh, red one in, in very bad ecological status. So as introduction has been done by Soyunas very well, so you can see that uh, we have most of problems 
uh, in the middle part and western, uh, um, uh, northern part of, of Lithuania, and we have the best quality of, of rivers and ecological status here in, in southeastern part of Lithuania and in, in the western as, as well. So, but yeah, again, these are results for the second management cycle, and we are not ready yet to present the final results for the third one, but we are working very intensively on, and we have already preliminary results, but as they are not final, so I decided not to put them here. Okay, and chemical status of surface water bodies. These are also results from the previous cycle. So there were a few water bodies where we found uh, aqueous standards exceeded in, in rivers. And here you can see only a few stretches which are marked in, uh, in, in red as not achieving good, good chemical status. Uh, but what is important maybe to mention that we had uh, yesterday meeting with our Latvian colleagues and we are planning to change approach regarding that because European Commission does not like this approach that we measure priority substances only in few water bodies and we say that others are in good chemical state. So it seems that for the upcoming cycle, we will have completely different picture with all what water bodies and rivers read because European Commission asks to say if you are not monitoring uh, priority substances, you have to say that this water body is potentially at risk not for not achieving good chemical status. And the only justification to say that status is good is monitoring and uh, providing, how to say, uh, measurement results showing that equests are not exceeded. So that is going to be changed completely in this upcoming documents. Okay, okay so, so what are water bodies at risk? Because Suyunas was saying, uh, using this uh, term, and I, I was also, I'm also repeating. So we assume that water bodies at risk are those water bodies which are uh, below good status or can potentially be, be below good status. So that means that uh, moderate, uh, bad, or very bad status water bodies are called water bodies at risk, and they require some measures to be implemented or measures to be considered in programs of measure, measures uh, for achieving good ecological state. So what are results? These are again results for the second management cycle. Uh, we had uh, 822 water bodies of rivers uh, in total, and 51% of those were at risk, that means their status was not achieved or was expected to be not achieved. So from what I see now, uh, we will have this number of water bodies at risk. Mm, I don't know if I have to use the term considerably, but definitely high. And yeah, it, the reason was also mentioned by Svayunas, we have increased loads in, of agricultural pollution and number of water bodies at risk because of agricultural pollution has increased considerably. So finally, situation uh, after the second cycle will be worse than it was before. Uh, the same with lakes. Uh, previously, we had 40% of lakes in, at risk, uh, in not good status. And um, this number will be higher now as well. As regards lakes, uh, we have more data. Maybe I will show a picture later and, and comment. Yeah, but there are a few factors um, for, for that. We have we collected more data and see that situation is worse than we actually thought before. And some pressures also they become more, how to say, more serious. And yeah, and all transitional and coastal water bodies, they are currently at risk and they will definitely remain at risk for, for a long time <laughs> because we have big imports of pollution into these water bodies. So what are the reasons uh, of not achieving good status? So starting from the first cycle uh, up to now, we have the, the same list of, of pressures affecting our uh, water bodies. So one, I would say that the two of these are most important. So this is diffuse agricultural pollution and hydromorphological modifications. So uh, river straightening, which is done for the purposes of agriculture, 
for melioration, drainage, uh, drainage, and water level alteration due to hydropower, uh, hydropower activities. So if we look at the number of water bodies at risk, so those two uh, pressures are main, which are responsible for not achieving good status. Uh, we have points loss and uh, urban pollution as well as one of the pressure, but with years, it becomes less and less significant. And then again, it was also explained by Spoyunas very well that we had big investments in wastewater treatment plants. And uh, now, uh, Direct uh, urban wastewater treatment directive requirements, they are met in almost all agglomerations, which are larger than 2000 uh, uh, inhabitant equivalent. And we still have some problems regarding urban pollution, as I called it in, in this slide. But this is pollution from households which are not connected to centralized sewage systems. They are supposed to clean their wastewater themselves. But as we know in practice, this does not go very well and uh, wastewater sometimes released into into surface water bodies illegally not treated sufficiently and in some small water bodies below larger towns we see effects of such a urban pollution households which are not connected to centralized sewage connected system but it's also not how to say prevailing problem in Lithuania. Uh, aquaculture is also a source of pollution and which is very, how to say, difficult to prove. Uh, we see, uh, uh, how to say, con uh, ecological status worse below this aquaculture farms, uh, but not always they declare their discharges well. So this is, this is challenging. We only say that status is not okay and um, related to, to, to fish farm, which is in the vicinity. But um, yeah, theoretically, yes, but practically it's very, very difficult to, 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 to how to say, to prove that this is impact from, from this agriculture sites. And another also very important uh, pressure is uh, disrupted river continuity, that is dams, which um, I'd say prevent, it does not allow fish migration. I think you had a very nice presentation yesterday about this, I've heard or not. Yeah, yeah. this is again repeating from what Svayuna showed, uh, significant impacts from diffuse agricultural pollution. These are results from the second cycle, and then I will show you another picture of, of the current situation. So as it was said, this middle part of Lithuania and northern part of Lithuania, uh, they are prevailed with very good soils. And naturally, agriculture, crop production activities are very intensive in, in this part of Lithuania. And finally, we have a situation like this, where we have all water bodies, nearly all water bodies with elevated uh, nitrogen concentrations in them. So this is how it looked at the beginning of the second cycle. Uh, yes, as regards point and urban pollution, you can see in this map, there are only few river stretches which are significantly affected by point pollution. And these are mainly very small streams we have very which have very limited uh, pollution accumulation potential. That means in, in many of those cases, wastewater treatment plants, they treat wastewater to the required standards. But the problem is that water body is so small that wastewater discharge makes nearly half percent of the total water discharge in the river. So because of very low dilution in summer periods, they are at risk and not achieving good status. Here you can see straight into river stretches. There is a quite big number of such rivers in Lithuania which have been straightened for the purposes, as I mentioned, for agriculture, for, for, for drainage. And we treat those straightened stretches differently. Uh, some, some of them, them which are which are actually located in flat areas and in agricultural fields, they are treated as heavily modified water bodies because uh, economic an analysis has been done and it showed that restoration of such water bodies is not reasonable economically and the benefit of restoring good ecological status of such water bodies could be lower than costs 
of doing that because that means if you destroy drainage system, farmers will not be able to to perform to, to conduct the agricultural activities in that area, and it's a obviously direct uh, effect, economical effect. So those water bodies are treated as heavily modified and we are not planning to achieve good status. In these water bodies, we are planning for good ecological potential. Uh, but other river stretches, which are in hilly uh, landscapes or in uh, areas not used for agriculture, they are treated as water bodies at risk. So that means that we plan some measures for restoring their hydromorphology and achieve good ecological status of, of such water bodies. Uh, continuity issues, I borrowed this picture from our EPA. So here is a situation when we have, it shows that we have quite few uh, water bodies where we have uh, existing fish passes. In most of them, fish passes are not available. So that is another, another pressure, uh, not achieving, not uh, preventing from achieving good ecological status. Uh, yeah, yeah. So here are already some, some first results, uh, first assessment results for, for the first cycle, but that, that things that we are doing now and trying to uh, put everything into I'd say places and so that uh, documents are ready by the end of the year. So here we, we can already uh, compare how situation is changing in lakes uh, from in first and third management cycles. So if you compare, uh, and these are results for different uh, river bases. And here you can see number of water bodies which are in different, in different states. So if you compare those two columns, you can see that the uh, number of uh, good and very good water bodies has decreased and number of moderate, bad and very bad uh, water bodies has increased in many river basins. And here again, uh, I, I, as I already said, that there are two reasons for that. We collect more data, more biological data, what is very important and newly collected data, the more we know, about water bodies, the more we confident are, uh, the, the more we realize the situation uh, estimated earlier was too optimistic, maybe. Our water bodies actually are in worse status than before, because in first river basin management cycles, we relied a lot on, on mathematical modeling, on expert judgment, and so on. So data was not available. So now we collect more data and we see that uh, unfortunately, we were too optimistic with some water bodies. Uh, and as for, for rivers, here yeah, I have already these are natural water bodies. Uh, we are revising criteria for assessment of ecological potential for heavily modified water bodies. So I'm not presenting results for heavily modified water bodies now, but for natural rivers, more or less situation is clear. And you can see that situation is similar as with lakes, a uh, number of water bodies with moderate, bad, and very bad status has percentage has increased in comparison with, uh, with previous management cycles. And uh, as, regards for, as regards rivers, so agriculture is responsible for this increase very significantly. So not very optimistic picture. Yeah. yeah, and uh, if these areas affected significantly by agriculture were smaller before. So now the impact of agriculture a kind of extends to the areas which were not affected earlier. So uh, maybe I will not repeat, so you must give a very good presentation what is happening with our agriculture. And when we all analyze trends, I think that already now we can see some impacts of climate change because we had few years where we had extremely high, concent high concentrations of nitrates in rivers. And that is was because we had extremely dry summers uh, and farmers were fertilizing their crops normally as we do always. But if, as summer was very dry, all fertilizers, they remain in soil not uptaken by plants. 
So finally, in autumn and, and in winter time, all those uh, nitrogen uh, compounds accumulated in soil were simply washed out in rivers, and we have situation much worse than it was before because it's not how to see situation uh, meteorological and hydrological uh, conditions were not in favor of, of our rivers and uh, and intensity of agriculture increases as well uh, we had a few years before i think in this northern region we had the uh, best yields of crop and ever so it's very it's very high and of course it's related again with very intensive application of, of mineral fertilizers so finally we have picture which is worse than it was before with impacts of agriculture a few words about measures what we have planned to do and what we implemented and what is still waiting for us in the future uh, so uh, program of measures was it was not prepared as a separate document, but all uh, measures for the second management cycle, they were integrated in the legal document, which is called what the sector development program for 2007, 2023. And this document included all measures which were planned for achieving good status of water bodies at risk. So a few words about each type of measure. So, uh, for reduction of point pollution, uh, it was planned to conduct reconstruction of, of wastewater treatment plants uh, in those, how to say, uh, towns where um, those uh, plants um, impact uh, pollution problems. Uh, as I've mentioned, uh, in many cases, they, these wastewater treatment plants they operate very well and treat sufficiently wastewater, but this is not this is not enough to achieve good status. So reconstruction was planned even to to increase the level of treatment even more to achieve good status of these short short river stretches. So all all of what is planned it is uh, those projects all projects have started. So implementation of this measure is uh, is okay and this measure is is being implemented although not finished. All those reconstruction projects have to be finished in 2022 2023. So we still do not have, do not see effect of, of this measure, but hopefully the effect will be seen in in a few years. Uh, also. It was planned to revise pollution permits of some outlets discharging wastewater into river stretches, rivers at risk, uh, extend wastewater collection infrastructure. Those projects also are financed by, by EU project and uh, infrastructure is developing in, in many agglomerations. So more and more people are connected, households are connected to sewerage system, centralized sewerage system. So we can also hope that situation will, will be better soon. And also it was planned in, uh, to revise some legislation and it was done. So now uh, it is, uh, how to say, um, all outlet, all uh, wastewater treatment plants or, or point sources, they have to be evaluated uh, if for impacts on receiving water body. So if they apply for pollution permits, they have to um, ensure that uh, their pollution will not harm ecological status of receiving water body. So these changes of legislation were made and now each time when point sources apply for, for permits, we have to prove that the effect will not be significant. Uh, if thinking about future, um, there is still a risk that in some water bodies, although those measures are implemented, there is still a risk that good status will not be achieved because um, situation and climate change changes and uh, rivers are really small so it can be that even after implementing all those measures we will not be able to achieve good status in all those water bodies which are currently affected by point pollution uh, as regards diffuse agricultural pollution in this cycle and uh, i would say very i would say very soft measures were planned 
Uh, these are measures targeted at better management of uh, fertilizer and um, the educating of, of farmers and uh, uh, better assessment of uh, fertilizer application. Uh, but as regards measures which could really affect nutrient loads, I would say very little was done. And uh, how to say, hope it was a big hope that the rural development program will help with its measures and maybe those measures which are implemented by uh, by cap uh, help to reduce agricultural pollution but i here take example from the most polluted river basin district and what was happening with agricultural agro environmental measures in this in this period so these are five measures which could potentially be very helpful for, for reduction of uh, nutrient pollution. Uh, the yellow one is ecological farming. So when we calculate the balance, nutrient balance, our assessment shows that in ecological farms, uh, nutrient balance is by 40% lower than in, in normal intensive uh, farms. So that would mean that uh, ecological farms should be very helpful to reduce nutrient loads in rivers. So what is happening? Here we have areas which are not have to say, favor, favorable for, for agriculture. And here we have most fertile soils. And what is happening? Uh, ecological farms are established in those areas which are not good for farming. That means that far farmers are not keen to do ecological farming in those areas which are most polluted and because it's economically not what to say, good for, for farmers. So all uh, ecological farms in Lithuania are located in the areas like, like this with poor soil quality and uh, not, not good for intensity agriculture. So that means that situation here, we, we have most polluted rivers, we, it did not change at all, and pollution has increased even. Uh, another measure, which was also mentioned by Svayunas, which was also promoted by us an expert, uh, catch crops, which could be very, very good to retain nutrients from soil after harvest is taken. So these are red Red areas. You can also see very few areas of such measure were implemented in, in those uh, agricultural areas. And uh, other measures like um, um, uh, improvement of water bodies at risk, which is uh, changing arable land to grasslands and pastures, uh, farmers, we, did, we were not interested in this measure at all. So this measure was implemented in, I, I don't remember, maybe one or two hectares in this area. So it, it does not work. So it looks very nice on the model when we estimate efficiency of those measures. But the question is how to make farmers implement them. Because these uh, schemes under rural development program, they are voluntary. Farmers may apply for funding of, of implementing such measures, but they are not interested interested to do this because payments are not sufficient and they have obligations for five years to do something and they lose profit and, and so on and so on. So there are many arguments why they do not do this. So we, we do this ecological farming in the areas which are not polluted at all. So that is good, of course, but as regards the water framework directive objectives, this does not help at all. Uh, for, for lakes, what was done? Uh, some fish manipulation projects were planned and they were implement, they are under implementation now. So the implementation is initiated. So we'll see what was happening. Uh, also removal of microfide biomass in, in few, few lakes. It's, it, this is also ongoing. Uh, also some revision of legislation was planned and it was done. So currently uh, it is um, not allowed uh, from 
it is how to say it's set in the regulation that from 2025 any discharges to lakes and rivers at a distance of 500 meters to lake will not be allowed uh, yeah and some control of fish farms also was done some of them were given fines so hopefully some pollution from fish farms will decrease but it's only theor theoretical thoughts and yeah, yeah hydromorphological yeah. status and restoration of river continuity. Uh, as I said, some rivers which are at risk of river straightening, they demand some measures for restoring their, uh, their hydromorphology. So our EPA has initiated a number of projects. We have already funding allocated from EU sources to do this uh, soft renaturalization measures. So here is a picture how it was done. It's so done very simply. Uh, they put uh, stones, uh, gravel, wood, and, and so on to create uh, artificial obstacles to river remeander. So currently, those projects are planned for over 130 river stretches. And they are very now, maybe I don't know, maybe someone knows better, but they are under implementation in few of them. But as funding is allocated, so hopefully they will be implemented everywhere where, where they need it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And regards what you got, removal of migration obstacles, it was planned also to remove some dam remains in, in some rivers. But the implementation of such measure is also rather challenging because those dams are often uh, owned by private companies and by private persons. So not of them are very enthusiastic to removing uh, those remains. So out of um, all projects planned, I think only few have been implemented in this management cycle. So, but some of them were implemented successfully. And uh, revision of legislation, some revisions were planned, they are not done yet. Uh, some scientific studies have been conducted. So hopefully considering results of those studies, there will be some changes in Lithuanian legislation and some strict requirements for operation of hydropowers will be set. But again, this is, this is not easy because there is a big pressure from owners of hydropower plants. We, of course, do not want these things to be in, in our legislation. Okay, so, and uh, final, final words about challenges for the upcoming threat to river basin management cycle. So, as I've mentioned, we are planning to, uh, to have these documents prepared by the end of, of this year. And then the third cycle, which is the last one, is going to start. And then we will have six last six years to achieve requirements of the water frame of directive. Uh, so I don't think it will be easy to do uh, because we are starting this management cycle with a higher number of water bodies at risk than we were before. And uh, my forecast is not very optimistic. Uh, because we are participating in the discussions of Ministry of Agriculture and plans of a future CAP, uh, uh, common agricultural policy. So um, there are no big plans to extend uh, uh, implementation of agri-environmental measures under CAP. They plan quite a small budget for that. And as we see from experience from of the previous cycles, farmers are, are not very enthusiastic of implementing all these agro-environmental measures. So how we will deal with those water bodies at risk? It's a big, it's a big question. And how these measures can be implemented in, in this last, last period. Mm, yeah, and when we calculate uh, pollution reduction objectives, so in some some water bodies in northern part of Lithuania, pollution reduction up to 70% uh, of load is needed. So if we talk about, if you think about measures which might be needed to achieve such reduction, I know what modeling shows, but in reality, it, 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 that means that 
whole each hectare has to be covered with measure which efficiency is 70 percent that is hardly possible the only way to achieve this efficiency is to convert arable land into grasslands and, and pasture. But we know that no one will convert arable land into pasture where arable land feeds you and gives the largest profit. So it is not realistic. And um, I don't know, I think we have to think about maybe less stringent objectives, which is allowed, theoretically allowed by the Directive Article 4, but no one has done it before, I think. And if we apply for more less stringent objectives, for the European Commission, we need to have very, very strong justification for that. So that means that we have to start some big study, calculate, do economic assessment, and to prove that converting arable land into patches and measures is not, how to say, acceptable economically in Lithuania. And again, no one knows what is going happening after 2027, because theoretically, there is the end of the road. Everything ends in, in 2027. But as we see in Lithuania, it's hardly possible that we achieve good status by then. And I think it's situation will be the same in, in other countries. So it's a question what's happening later. So maybe we can discuss now about this.